Bienvenidos a La Oveja Eléctrica, la revista de ciencia y pensamiento de Canal 22, en donde hablaremos de un proyecto lunático para cerrar la brecha digital entre los que tienen y los que no tienen Internet. ¿Qué tal, Pepe? ¿Qué tal, Silvina? Pues así es. Fíjate qué dato. Dos terceras partes de la población mundial no tienen acceso a la información y comunicación de Internet. Y por ello, mediante una propuesta que se denomina Loom Project, se pretende conectar por Internet a todo el planeta mediante globos que flotan en el espacio. La palabra Loom alude a Balloon, que quiere decir globo en inglés, pero también se refiere a algo francamente lunático. A ideas locas para lograr que todos estemos conectados. Pepe Gordon estuvo en Mountain View, en California, en las oficinas internacionales de Google y nos trae una información increíble. Entrevistó en exclusiva para Canal 22 a Mike Cassidy, ingeniero en aeronáutica, director de Loom Project. Mike Cassidy, thank you very much for this interview for Channel 22. Sure, I'm happy to be here. You envision a future in where we have a party with thousands of balloons floating in the stratosphere. <laughs> Tell us what is this party all about and how it's going to be related to our future. Sure. Well, on this party there will be tens of thousands of balloons floating 20 kilometers up in space, in the atmosphere twice as high as airplanes fly. And these balloons will be sailing around with the wind. And wherever they're sailing, they'll be broadcasting internet down to the ground. So today there's five billion people uh, on the planet who don't have internet access, two out of every three people. And in this party in the future, all these people will have this internet. How, how does that, did, how this idea came about? Well, balloons have been used for communication for a long time. Even about AD 200, uh, Chinese military was using balloons to communicate uh, with lanterns and things like that. Uh, and Larry Page, uh, the CEO of our company, spoke about this idea over a decade ago. But it wasn't until about two years ago that someone at Google X, Rich Duvall, Uh, took uh, a Wi-Fi transmitter, put it on a latex weather balloon, launched it 10 or 15 kilometers up in the sky and actually was getting Wi-Fi si signals down to the ground that we knew you could actually do it. And uh, how this began to be materialized? Because one thing is to have the idea and another is to begin to believe in it. Uh, I think one of the key things that helped us believe in it was the breakthrough in terms of could you, how could you provide continuous coverage to someone on the ground. People had thought before about something like this, but they were thinking about one of two different ways. One is having a physical tether, a long cable, uh, holding a balloon in place. But that has obvious problems that airplanes and things might crash into the cable. The other approach people had thought about was having a balloon or dirigible stay in a fixed location above the ground by constantly running an engine and propellers to fight against the wind. But how do you refuel it? Or if you use solar energy, what do you do at night? Ultimately, all those ideas never worked, but we had a key idea, which was, what if you didn't make the balloon stay at the same place? What if you let, as one balloon moved away, you'd correctly position another balloon to come and take its place. Go to, with the flow. Go with the wind, which means you have to plan very carefully. So if you want a certain balloon over, say, Christchurch, New Zealand, at noon on Wednesday, three days before that, when the balloon is maybe over Perth, Australia, you've got to say to that balloon, we need you to go a little bit further south in order to be over Christchurch in three days. So decrease in altitude by one kilometer, catch a wind that's going a slightly different direction, that will in three days bring you to the spot we want you to be. So that's, this is like dancing with computers, no? Uh, to, to, learn, to teach the, the balloons to dance with uh, computer science and algorithms. That's a great analogy. It is like choreography, like telling the dancers how to move across the stage and where to be at a certain time. Yes, choreography is a great analogy.
La danza de los globos mediante la informática. Una idea loca para comunicar a todo el planeta con Internet. Más adelante hablaremos de los problemas técnicos para materializar este concepto. Como de rayo, estamos de regreso en la oveja eléctrica para hablar de Loon Project, una propuesta muy imaginativa para cerrar la brecha digital entre los que tienen y los que no tienen Internet. Pepe Gordo nos trae una gran conversación con Mike Cassidy, el director de Loon Project en Google, que ha soltado unos globos que danzan en el cielo para lograr que la señal de Internet llegue a lugares hasta ahora inaccesibles. Mike Cassidy le dice a Pepe Gordon cuáles son las dificultades que los científicos tuvieron que enfrentar. What were the problems, the technical problems? Because you know so, this idea is very nice and you can say we can have these algorithms, but in in fact to have them it's another thing. There were a lot of technical problems. Uh, for one thing, Uh, most of the weather balloons that are launched every day, they are made out of latex and they pop once they reach a certain altitude. So you need to design balloons that are strong enough that when they reach super pressure condition, when the pressure inside the balloon is higher than outside, they won't pop. And the conditions up at 20 kilometers high are very challenging. It's very cold up there, minus 50 degrees Celsius, so a lot of your Plastics and metals become very brittle. Um, there's very little atmosphere up there. Only about 2% of the atmosphere that's on the ground is the pressure you have up there. So you have to design things that can work almost in a vacuum. You're almost in space at that point. And in fact, if you look at cameras uh, on our balloons used to monitor the systems during testing, you can see the black space and the curvature of the Earth up there. And finally, it's a very intense ultraviolet Uh, environment. There's no sun to block out the intense rays, and those ultraviolet rays will damage your plastic and other materials on the balloons. And what other kind of breakthroughs do you have to do regarding science to develop a project of this kind? The altitude control part was a big breakthrough. Uh, some people think, well, why is that so hard? Just make the balloon and go up and down. But what you're fighting against is buoyancy. And I sometimes like to make the analogy, if, if you take a beach ball and you sit it on the surface of a swimming pool, if you try to push that beach ball down in the pool, like push it down three feet, see how hard it is to push it down into the denser water. That's the same problem when you've got a balloon up at 20 kilometers. If you try to push that balloon down one kilometer, it's a very hard problem to fight against the denser atmosphere. We devised a system that has two chambers inside the balloon. One chamber is full of helium, and the bottom chamber is has air in it. To make the balloon go down, we fill the bottom chamber with air. We pump the air in from outside. That makes it heavier, the balloon goes down. Then when it's time to go up, we pump that air out. Actually, all you have to do is open a little valve and the air pushes itself out. And then the balloon rises. Oh, but that has to be controlled like a drone, yes? In some way, because you don't have man, man, men there's certainly no, doing that. There's certainly no the, people on the balloons now. Yes, so? Um, It, we have many automated systems that um, control where the balloons go, control their altitude, and we have software, a mini computer on the balloon, that opens and closes the valves at the right time to make it go to the right altitude. On the ground, we always have people watching to make sure the balloons are doing what they're supposed to be doing, but much of the systems are all automated. Yeah, big computer program. And uh, what area, each, each balloon, how much area showers? with the sign of internet? Uh, it covers a circle on the ground about 40 kilometers in diameter. So um, that's, a, uh, that's about 1,000 uh, square kilometers of, of area underneath the balloon. So uh, when envisioning uh, the future, how many balloons would have to be on the Earth to cover the whole population? Well. When we launched our pilot test in New Zealand, um, we were calculating about 300 balloons to make one ring around the Earth. That ring would be about 40 kilometers wide. So as you try to cover more and more of the Earth, you're talking thousands of balloons required to cover more of the Earth. But the interesting thing is you don't have to cover every square inch of the Earth. For example, there's large swaths of 
maybe the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which you don't need to have internet coverage there. So one of the things we calculate is where do the balloons most need to be located to provide optimal coverage where people need them. And in that sense, how many are you thinking about? Well, it's certainly thousands. Uh, we don't know the exact number because it's changing. It changes with the diameter of coverage. If we can make the coverage area a little bigger, then we need fewer balloons. If, it's, uh, if the coverage area shrinks, we need more balloons. And it also depends on how well we can control the balloons. If we can control them so we just need exactly the right amount over the areas needing coverage and we don't need any over the ocean, then we don't need that many balloons. But if we need to have some traveling with the winds over the oceans to reach the other areas where we need coverage, then it's more. So it, that number is changing all the time. And what about the ground stations? Because you also need ground yes. stations. Yes. Um, so we do have ground stations which are connected to the internet that beam the internet up to one balloon. And then from that balloon, we beam it to a next balloon, balloon to balloon, and potentially to a third and fourth balloon before it goes down to the ground to reach um, an end user. And we think about five hops between balloons is about the maximum we want to do. Currently, with this uh, distance of um, 40 kilometers of coverage, that also means 40 kilometers between balloons, five hops would be about 200 kilometers you could reach from a ground station till you uh, had your balloon reaching an end user. Now in the future, uh, we have additional technology that we want to roll out that will let us go up to a thousand kilometers from a ground station to the fifth balloon out there. So that's you'd need far fewer ground stations if you can go a thousand kilometers. Oh. Yeah. Pues nunca imaginamos que el cielo futurista estaría lleno de globos para bañar al mundo con las señales invisibles de internet. Seguiremos con este interesante tema de vanguardia. Como de rayo estamos de regreso en la oveja eléctrica con una idea loca. En términos políticamente correctos se habla de una idea de vanguardia. Lanzar globos al espacio para que todos tengan acceso al ciberespacio. Esta propuesta se llama Loon Project y Pepe Gordon estuvo en Mountain View en California en las oficinas internacionales de Google, en donde conversó con el ingeniero en aeronáutica Mike Cassidy, director de este programa que ha sorprendido a la comunidad científica. Tenemos algunas imágenes que por primera vez se transmiten en la televisión mexicana sobre cómo fue que esta idea pasó de la utopía a la realidad. Tell me how, how, it, how it started the, the first test in which you tried a balloon, the pilot test yeah. to, to, to fly a balloon around the Pacific Ocean, yeah? Well, the very first tests uh, that we did here in California were just in the Central Valley, farmlands, and they were using latex balloons that went up and popped. Uh, the first tests we did in New Zealand I uh, used uh, polyethylene super pressure balloons, ones that reached a fixed volume. And it was very exciting from about 50, 60 kilometers west of Christchurch, we launched a series of six balloons. We knew from our forecasts the exact trajectory the balloons would take, and we were able to provide continuous coverage over Christchurch for several hours as each balloon in sequence launched at the right time, rose to the correct altitude, flew over the city, and provided continuous coverage on the ground. I was there that day, uh, the first test. Um, there was a, an entrepreneur, a farmer, uh, about 100 kilometers south of Christchurch. Uh, he, he raises sheep, he runs a gym, his name is Charles. And uh, so for the very first time, when the balloon flew overhead and in his kitchen, he opened up the internet and was searching for things, searching for the weather, and it was so much fun to watch him be excited, like, wow, it works and it's fast. It was oh. great. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> and, and this is, takes us to the great uh, step uh, and the great future that is envisioned by this technology. And that means uh, how this can help to, to uh, fight the digital divide, because we are having a huge digital divide nowadays, and this means we don't have democracy of knowledge. Absolutely, and so many people on the team, that's what we get excited about every day. 
Uh, I mean, to imagine a billion people in Africa, a lot of them don't have internet access. And to be able to bring them even things like weather reports, so farmers can grow better crops. Um, or uh, education. Imagine being able to see Khan Academy videos or see to learn online how to become a computer programmer it can be brought to you by you know the balloons or medical information you know a lot of people who have internet take for granted something something hurts they're sick they can go online and look up you know how to fix it a lot of people who don't have access can't do that now we can bring medical information and just knowledge just Wikipedia or Google searches I mean just the ability to do all this uh, I think is crossing the information divide, the digital divide. And, and a lot of people think that that problem's solved, that, that everyone has internet access. It's just not true. I mean, two out of three people on the planet do not have good internet access today. So we're just very excited about it, trying to help. Dos de cada tres personas no tienen internet. A eso se le llama la brecha digital. En nuestro próximo programa, Mike Cassidy nos habla del reto de imaginación científica que implica este proyecto de la innovación que está en juego y de cómo ha respondido la comunidad científica a un pensamiento que se sale de la caja de lo convencional.